Hi there, I am Dave Humphrey and I wanted to welcome you to the second half of Web 422. So in the first half of the course, you've been focused on React and other UI libraries and starting to learn how to build component-based web apps. And in the second half of the course, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the knowledge that you've gained in the first half and we're gonna expose you to another popular another popular framework, this time with Angular. So React and Angular are, they're gonna feel very, very different. Uh, if I was to give you my biases up front, I definitely consider myself more of a React developer than an Angular developer. I like the style of React a lot, um, but I also appreciate some of the things that both have to offer. And I think that understanding and learning both of these different tools is, it's gonna help you in terms of really understanding what's at the base of what's going on because both of them at the end of the day are just building applications in JavaScript, HTML, CSS. And so, you know, you're, you're taking different paths to get there. So the React, um, the React website says that it's a library. Uh, it's a library for building user interfaces. And if you go to Angular, that this is a framework for um, building mobile and desktop apps, web apps. What you're gonna find with Angular is that it is a lot more all-encompassing. It's heavier. There are built-in solutions to every problem that you're going to encounter. And there are also a lot of opinions about how you should solve a lot of the different things that you're trying to build. So Angular is a highly opinionated framework. It requires you to build things in a particular way. React, on the other hand, leaves a lot to the developer. The developer has to figure out uh, which tools they're gonna to use. For example, take something like CSS, how you're going to do CSS in the application. And there's dozens and dozens of different ways that the community has cooked up to do this. That can be empowering when you know what you wanna do and you're not limited to do things in a particular way, but it can also be a burden when you're learning things and what you really want is you just wanna know what's the right way to do this. So if you're someone who enjoys knowing the right way to build something in a particular framework, that's one thing I think you'll find with Angular. So I wanna just call out before we do anything else, how valuable the docs are. Both of these projects have exceptional documentation and the docs for Angular, just have them open in a tab. On my computer, I've got hundreds of tabs open to the Angular docs because I'm constantly looking things up, trying to familiarize myself with it. With Angular, I find that it's not hard, but there, there's just a lot of syntax. Some of the syntax is very unique to Angular. It's, I have to look it up. Every time I'm building something with Angular, I'm you know constantly going through the docs and trying to re-familiarize myself with what's going on. Okay, so how are we gonna how are we gonna tackle the topics? We've got a whole bunch of things that we wanna cover in the next month or so related to Angular. My approach that I like to take when I'm learning or even teaching a technology like this is I think it's really important to start with writing programs, writing real programs. Uh, rather than giving you a bunch of slides and saying, you know, here's this and this and this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you through building something real. And as we do it, I'm gonna try and explain what's going on and give you, just give you some insight into how this technology works. Okay, so let me show you what I'm gonna, I'm gonna be building with you. One of my favorite examples to work on is anything that has to do with a real data set, especially if you can do something with a data set that is local. So the Ontario government has a lot of open data sets and they're really, they're fun to work with because they are, you know, something that's all around us. It's something, you know, if you live in Ontario, then you're, you're encountering these things. So the one that I'm gonna be working on is this bridge conditions data set. And the data set was created in order to track what's going on with all of the bridges in the province that the government is taking care of. When were they built? When were they last, um, when, when were they inspected? When were they last uh, worked on, et cetera? What are they made of? All of those kinds of things. One of the things that the data set has though that's really fun is it has all of the coordinates, all the latitude and longitude to figure out where these bridges are. So we can use that to, 
to, to do something interesting. So I'll get to that. So a note on working with open data sets. So this data set says um, that it has a license and most of the data sets or most of the code and things you're going to find on the web are going to have some kind of a license or data, um, some kind of a set of restrictions. So if, if it didn't have a license, I couldn't do anything with it. Um, it would be copyright by the government and I'm not necessarily able to go and do anything with it. But this one is licensed under the Open Government License of Ontario. And if you go and open up this license, it tells you what you can and can't do. And you can read this on in full on your own, but I wanna just look at this number three here. We can copy, modify, publish, translate, adapt, distribute, or otherwise use the information in any medium, mode, or format for any lawful purpose. That's wonderful. For our purposes, that means that we can take this data, we can clean it up, we can translate it into a different format, we can visualize it, we can do a whole bunch of different things with it. So here's what the data looks like. They ship the data as a set of comma separated values and they have a nice little explorer that you can go and you can look at the data on, um, on the web. And essentially what we have here is, um, you know, every one of these bridges has a name and it has latitude and it has longitude and a whole bunch of other information, some of which I don't know what, it, what it's all about, but when it was built, when it was last inspected, how long the bridge is, how wide the bridge is, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to take this data set here and I'd like to work it into an Angular app. And further, I'd like to show you how to take third-party JavaScript libraries. This is a course where you're focused on learning to use JavaScript libraries, CSS frameworks, etc., to build applications, web apps. So I'm going to use one of my favorite libraries called Leaflet. What Leaflet allows you to do is to build interactive maps like this map here. And you can do all the sorts of things that you would expect to be able to do with something like Google Maps. Um, and the code for doing it is not too bad. So I'll be taking you through using the leaflet code inside of um, an Angular component, building a component to wrap around this. So let me just jump right to it. Here is what I want to build. This is the finished product. So if this was a cooking show, I'm showing you the thing that's just come out of the oven. And I want to work toward building this. So the thing that we have here when the app starts we have a responsive app where on the left hand side, we have a list of all of these bridges. And if I click on one of these bridges, what it's going to do, uh, it's going to load on the right hand side a map. It's going to show me on the map where this bridge is. And it's going to tell me some information about it, how wide this bridge is, the length of the bridge, how many years old it is, etc. So we have a nice little explorer for being able to go through this data set visually and being able to interact with it, which is a lot nicer than doing, you know, like this it doesn't really help us. It's hard to it's hard to take this and understand what you're looking at here. Um, but when I give you this, it becomes a lot easier for us to figure out exactly what's going on. So. I'm gonna slowly work my way toward building this thing and I'm gonna go through and use lots of different pieces of Angular in order to do it. If you're interested, I have done this in the past with other frameworks. So I've written it in Vue and I'll provide the links to GitHub where you can read through and see how I did it there. I've also built it in React. So if you want to try and do this in React, you would be able to follow along with that as well. So sometimes having um, the same program in multiple frameworks can be helpful because it helps you to see what are the differences and the common pieces between each one of these things. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'll just pause my recording briefly here and I'll set up my environment so we can start building this thing. Okay, so I have just cleared a few things away so we can get started on the code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin by using the Angular CLI to generate a new project. So if you, in previous week, uh, you installed the ng, make sure you have ng 
installed on your machine and running. So if I test it on mine, um, it should print out for me and say, okay, this is the version that I'm running. I am running Angular version 10, which was just released uh, on um, the LTS version of, of Node. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to generate a new workspace, Angular workspace. So I'm gonna say I wanna create a new workspace and I'm gonna call it Bridge. And I'm gonna give it a couple of, um, uh, a couple of hints about how I wanna set this up. So the first thing, one of the topics we're gonna to be working on is we're gonna be talking about routing. So I'm gonna ask it to generate the, what I need in order to do routing in the application. I'm going to choose CSS and you know, not because you have to, if you wanna use SAS or less or any number of different um, CSS frameworks you can, I'm just gonna stick with, uh, I'm going to stick with CSS to keep it simple. And for the moment, um, I'm not going to bother with uh, the tests and all uh, for each one of the files. Later on, we're going to get into doing testing. <clears throat> Excuse me. But for now, I'm not going to bother. So I'll let this run and let it create and install the various packages. And I'll just pause this so you don't have to wait and I'll come back when it's ready. Okay, so that's finished, and that took on my Mac, which is fairly well powered. It, it took a number of minutes, so it had to download and install a ton of packages. It had to compile a bunch of native code, and there's a lot to do. So what I would like to do now is just take you through what it built for me. So I'm gonna um, gonna open up my editor, and uh, inside of the bridge directory and take you through what is here. Let me just get this set up so that we can take a look at it. Okay. So lots of things, lots of things just got installed. What what do you have when you create a, an Angular workspace like this? Let me just give you a quick tour of this and I won't go into all the details of it now and we're gonna be talking about lots more of these things as we go, but so at the very top, you're gonna to have this E to E directory and this thing is where um, later on we get into testing and we start talking about different types of tests. These are where uh, our end to end tests go. So this is the kind of testing where you wanna be able to simulate what a user would do from the front of the application all the way back through to the back end. So doing end-to-end -end testing. So for now, we're just gonna, we're gonna leave this alone. Node modules you'll know from working on uh, Web 3.2.2 and working with React, you'll know that lots and lots of stuff gets installed here. So on my machine, if I take a look at the node modules directory, I've got, well, let's see how many I've got. Um, 883 different um, packages were installed here. And so, you know, what's in here? All kinds of things. Um, testing libraries, things for working with JSON, things for working with Webpack. We'll talk a lot about Webpack, which is the default bundler that we're using. Uh, parsers, TypeScript, compilers, all just tons and tons of different things that are in here. Um, the other thing, to note about what's in, what's installed in node modules is that inside the .bin directory, you have a bunch of executables. So these are various scripts that can be run and things that will be run by parts of the build system. So for example, we've got, you know, Webpack is here, TSC, the TypeScript compiler, TSLint, the TypeScript linting tool, etc. So whenever our scripts need to interact with any of these binaries, uh, any of these executable scripts, they're all, they're all in here. Uh, okay, what else have we got? So source is where all of our applications code is gonna go. And I, I think one of the things that's nice to see what they've done here in terms of you learning about how you wanna set up your own projects when you're building software, uh, what they've done is they've put the source code separate from all the configuration for the project. So all of this, all these config files and boilerplate and documentation and tests and so on, they're separated out from the source 
and the source here is its own directory. So I'll, I'll come back to source. Uh, I'll come back to source in a minute, but let's talk about all these other things that are in here. What else have we got? We've got a browser's list RC file. So you'll notice that it's a dot file, it's a hidden file. And this is a RC file, a run control file from you know old style Unix uh, terminology. This is a config file that says to the build system, these are the browsers that I care about running um, or that I want my app to support. So you can actually run a command. If you do npx browsers list, what it'll do is it will print out and show you the all of the browsers that would be um, sort of the baseline for what it's going to support when it compiles your code. This is useful for you to be aware of because if you have to support older browsers or unique browsers in an enterprise, uh, you need to be able to go in here and say which version of Chrome or which version of Safari or whatever it is that I, I really care about because I want my build chain, I want that tool chain to uh, write polyfills and write all of the different pieces that are needed to backfill for support of newer features that I might be using. Uh, what else have we got? So we have an editor config file. And if you haven't worked with editor config before, it is a way for um, projects to specify how they want an editor to be set up. So things like line endings, are we using Unix line endings or Windows line endings? Are we using two space indents or are we using tabs or what are we doing? And so if you're working inside of uh, Visual Studio Code, which I am and I highly recommend that you do as well, you can install a, you can install a plugin um, editor config for VS Code. And when this is installed, if a dot editor config file is found, it will, it will read it and it will set up the defaults in your project so it does that. We have a git ignore direct, uh, file. So we're not focused on git in this course. If you take my open source course with me, I spend a lot of time going through in detail how Git works and how to use it. But suffice it to say, these are the files that we want to have Git ignore. Uh, what else do we have? We have a workspace configuration for Angular. So this is sort of the root for all of the, the defaults for the CLI and how the build works, how the code is set up. Um, how the commands run, what they target. So this is lots and lots of metadata for the different scripts and so on that we're going to be uh, using as part of Angular. We have a Karma file, comp file, uh, config file. So this is another automated testing framework. Karma allows you to test with real browsers. So if you want to run your tests against um, a live instance of Chrome or Firefox or what have you, this tells it how to do it, and it's got lots and lots of tools that will do things like launch the browser, run uh, run the test, interact back with the test system, etc. So uh, we'll come back to some of these things when we talk about testing. Package.json, this I'm sure you know about because you've been doing uh, 222, 322, and we've been working with it all the way through, but just a couple of things to note. So in your package.json, um, the things that I think are important for you to be aware of, number one, are the scripts. So there's a number of predefined scripts that you can run from the command line. And like, for example, if I want to build my code, uh, npm run build. When I do npm run build, it's going to run the build script that's defined here, which is an alias for ng build. So you can see that it's running ng build over here on the left. Right, so I could have done ng build, but I could also do npm run build. So these scripts, these are the ones that Angular has produced, but you can create your own. So anything that you want to put in here that will help automate your workflow, if there's something you're doing over and over again and you want to turn that into a script, this is a really nice place for you to put it. One thing to note here is that anything that is in the .bin directory of node modules is automatically part of your path. So when you say ng, for example, it, it knows how to find ng because it goes and it looks inside node modules.bin. So you don't have to 
you don't have to put that information into the path of what you're doing here. You can just assume that it's there and, and use it. So we have a bunch of these scripts. I'm gonna be talking later on in particular about um, how, to, how to run the uh, development server. So start, pay attention to that. Finally, we've got a whole bunch of dependencies and dev dependencies. The difference between the dependencies and dev dependencies, as you may already know, is that anything that I need in order to run the project that has to be bundled into the project, I'm gonna put in dependencies. And anything that I only need in order to be able to do development, to build the code, to run the tests, etc., I'm gonna put in dev dependencies. When you're setting up your project and we're gonna be installing a bunch of new things in our code, you wanna make sure you pick the right thing, whether it's dependencies or dev dependencies, because you don't want to have to install things that aren't necessary in order to run your code, or you know you want to be able to decide if I'm in production or if I'm in uh, if I'm in development. And you'll see that all the Angular stuff has been namespace with this at Angular syntax. So you know when you're looking for pieces of the Angular platform, you'll see at Angular slash core at Angular slash forms and so on all the way down through. Um, okay, good. So what else do we have? We have a lock file, which is telling us all thousands and thousands of lines of, you know, I'm using this particular version of the Babel helper plugin utils uh, package, etc. So all of these are locked. And it's a good idea to have this because when you're going to do your testing, when you go to deploy this, and move it to another machine, it's going to ensure that the exact packages that you, the versions that you were developing on your machine are gonna be the same when you go to the other machine. A Couple more things to look at here. We've got a readme, self-explanatory, but good place for you to put docs. What kinds of things should you put here? Put notes to yourself about how to run your code, how to build your code, the organization of your code, um, Anything, anything that would help you or other developers on your team is a good place to throw it. Then we've got a whole bunch of different um, TypeScript configurations. So if you, you know, all of these are sort of part of the same, part of the same thing. So these are type declarations and compiler configurations for TypeScript. And when it's trying to build our app or build our tests, etc., it needs to know, you know, how, how all of this stuff is done. And finally, we have a set of rules for TSLint. So you're gonna find when you're, when you're working in Angular, it is constantly gonna be complaining at you. You forgot to do this, you shouldn't have done this, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And so the linter is, is your friend. It's, it's this friend that tells you you're wrong all the time. Uh, and the joke goes with linters that they'll hurt your feelings. And so this is what it's gonna do. This is why it's gonna hurt your feelings because there's tons and tons of rules in here that say your code has to be like this, 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 this. And if it's not, then I'm gonna complain. I'm gonna give a warning or I'm gonna do an error. So if you're trying to figure out why does my code constantly complain about this particular class of problem, it's because of the tslint.json file. And if you wanted to, you could alter it and change it around so that um, it does something different than what what you uh, what's happening right now. Um, okay, so very quickly, let's go back through these other two folders we haven't talked about. So at the very top, you'll notice I have a dist folder, and that's because I built my code. So when I ran the build script, what it did was it generated a distribution or a dist which has the built version of my code. So this is the version of my code that I would deploy to my web server. We're gonna talk about deployment in a number of weeks, but for now, if you wanted to figure out, you know, how would I put this up on a website? How would I do a production build, etc.? This is the answer. Here's what, you'll, here's what you'll use, your dist folder. And if we jump into source, um, let's just talk quickly about what's in here. Um, in the next series of videos, I'm gonna mostly be focusing on this directory and taking you through uh, the different components of you know, how we build this thing inside of source. But at the top level of what we have here, we have a bunch of things related to the shell of our app. So at the very top, we have an index.html file. And you'll note that in the index.html file, there's no scripts. There's no CSS, none of that stuff is here. All of that is going to be generated and it's gonna be put in there by Webpack. So it's gonna get loaded 
um, at runtime, but at compile time, you don't see it. So it's not there yet. It's going to be generated. You don't have to put any of that in. Um, we have a style sheet for global styles that we can add. And we've got a bunch of TypeScript files. So we have a main entry point where our application is going to get booted, get, we're going to mount it into the DOM, and it's going to run our application. We have um, polyfill.ts is for polyfills are if you need to, as I was saying before, you have a browser and you need to be able to support some feature, but the browser doesn't natively do it. This is going to load in pieces of JavaScript, which will, <clears throat> excuse me, which will run that feature even though the browser doesn't support it natively. So polyfill.js is there to support that. Place for our test, place for our favicon. So when you know which icon are we showing in the in the toolbar? A couple last things here. We have various environment settings. And you'll see, for example, in main TS that it is loading in the environment file. It imports the environment file and it checks to see whether or not we're in production. So by default, you're not in production. You're in a debug build. And so it's not gonna do some of the optimizations and it's gonna make it a little bit easier to debug things when you're in um, a debug build versus a production build. But we have uh, a place for defining different environments. So a production version, a staging version, a development version, uh, et cetera. Uh, and they can all have different variables and so on that get, that get set. We have a place assets. If you have anything static assets, so images, files, things that you need to be included in your web app, but you're not going to um, you're not going to have them be part of your code. They're just, you know, icons, for example. This is where you would stick them, and they'll get copied into um, your disk directory, so you have access to them. Uh, finally, we have app, and app is, as I say, really where we're going to live. It's where all of our uh, components are going to be placed, our modules, services, etc. And this is really where we're going to focus. So this is probably a good point for, um, this is a good place for me to pause and say that in the next videos, I'm going to take you through building out this application. So take this workspace, this empty workspace that we have, and I'm going to start filling it out with all the different pieces of Angular that we need. So I'll see you in the next videos.